Good evening and welcome to our Waymaking special event. I want to thank everyone for joining us during this important conversation about the impact of mental health and racism. Our country um, has been engaged in multiple conversations around um, the different topics around racism. We felt that it was important to discuss the intersection of racism and a topic that is near and dear to my heart as a school psychologist, mental health. My name is Dr. Christina Connolly, and I am the Director of the Division of Psychological Services for the Montgomery County Public Schools. This topic is near to my heart from growing up and listening to stories from my grandmother, and she was a psychiatric nurse, and my mother who started her career as a drug treatment therapist who constantly discussed the inequities of drug lobbyists focusing funding on drug treatment and never drug prevention. As a school psychologist, I have seen firsthand um, how institutional racism has led to a lack of mental health support in schools for those who need it most. This will be a two-part series starting tonight and continuing on July the 7th. So talking about mental health as a community is very important. So we need to make sure that we are normalizing this conversation in all of our communities because due to the stigma, we know too many individuals of color who go out and either don't seek treatment for mental health services or do not get the correct diagnosis for the support that they need. I have seen those who have experienced childhood trauma um, engage in domestic violence. I have seen students who did not receive the mental health support that they needed end up within our prison systems. What can we do within our schools and within our communities to help the cycle to end? We know that many people may have additional questions about a variety of mental health topics that are out there. We want folks to know that they can go to our Waymaking special website for the link to our Waymaking videos and they cover a variety of mental health topics including stress and anxiety, suicide prevention, sleep management, mindfulness, domestic violence, child abuse, and a variety of other topics. However, we wanna make sure people know that this conversation is not just about mental health. Our conversation is focused on how racism intersects with mental health. And so today, we wanna start off with a conversation on the barriers and stigma that prevent communities of color from participating in mental health support. On July 7th, we will focus and we were gonna end our conversation on how to eliminate these barriers and the stigma that is there in order to help us to increase access to mental health and increase the opportunities for receiving mental health services. So right now, I am going to turn this over. Um, I believe Dr. McKnight may be able to join us um, a little bit later. And so I'm going to turn our conversation over to uh, my other co-host, Mr. John Landsman. Thank you, Dr. Connolly. Hello, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. My name is John Landsman, and I'm the coordinator of the Study Circles program in the MCPS Equity Unit. I wanna begin by reiterating what Dr. Connolly said. Talking about mental health is something we have to normalize. Mental health is an issue I deal with personally and because of the stigma, it took me a long time to address. But talking about racism is also something we have to normalize. As a white man, there are many obstacles I did not need to overcome when I finally decided to address my mental health issues. In the equity, equity unit, we know that we can solve problems by talking about everything broadly. And this session is about the impact of racism on mental health. With this goal in mind, I'd like to explain tonight's agenda. Our session tonight is divided into three parts, two different panel discussions, and then a period for questions and answers. The first panel discussion will focus on the historical barriers for people of color to access and receive quality mental health services. The second panel discussion will focus on current practices and policies that are barriers for people of color to receive quality mental health services. 
We will also be interspersing videos of members of our, of our community talking about their experiences and perspectives on racism and mental health. Throughout, you can post your questions in the Q&A box. Two of our colleagues will compile the questions so that panelists can respond to the questions in the third section of the program. Before we introduce the panel, we want to take a minute to provide a few definitions for what we mean when we use the word racism. We believe that there are many definitions of the word. In the equity unit, we talk about four levels of racism, and I'm gonna go over those four levels right now. The first level is internalized racism. It lies within individuals and groups. It is a multi-generational process of dehumanization that can manifest as inferiority within people of color and as superiority within white people. The next level is the interpersonal level. This is the level that most people think about. If you've tuned, tuned into this forum, you probably work hard not to perpetuate this kind of racism. But if we only focus on this level, we miss the bigger systems that are causing the problems we see playing out in our country through COVID-19 and policing and education and in the mental health field. Next is the institutional level of racism. This level occurs within institutions. It is discriminatory treatment, unfair policies and practices, and inequitable opportunities and impacts based on race. Sometimes these are intentional and sometimes they're not, but they all have the same results. And finally, we wanna talk about structural racism. The problems we see in MCPS are not just because of the school district. Structural racism is a combination of all our history with current policies and practices across segments of our society. The disproportionate level of black and Latino residents getting sick and dying of COVID-19 is a clear example of how our economic, housing, and healthcare systems all work together to have the results that we get. Tonight, we're gonna to be focusing our conversation on the institutional and structural levels. This was a quick overview. If you want more information, we're gonna give you some resources at the end of the night where you can learn about the four levels of racism. So now that we have our definitions, Dr. Connolly will introduce the panelists and begin our conversation. Thanks, John. And so we're gonna start our conversation with um, talking about some of the historical barriers for people of color to access and receive quality mental health services. To get started, I would like to introduce two of our wonderful panelists. So first we have Dr. Charles Barrett, who is a lead school psychologist with the Loudoun County Public Schools and adjunct lecturer at Northern Virginia Community College, Howard University and George Mason University. And he is an award-winning educator. Dr. Barrett holds various leadership positions within the National Association of School Psychologists. So welcome Charles. So next we have Daniel Olivaria, who is an LCSW and he works in private practice as an owner of the City Psychotherapy New York. He provides therapy and business consulting on issues impacting quality of life for modern professionals, including um, relationships, personal identity and complex and interge intergenerational trauma. Welcome, Daniel. So to begin the conversation, Dr. Barrett, I want to start with you. Can you describe the historical mental health practices that negatively impacted communities of color? Please include examples of diagnosing, testing, and treatment facilities. Well, thank you, Christina, for the opportunity. Good to be here with all of you. I'm going to answer the question. Um, it may sound a bit tangential at first, but I do promise you it's, it's going to make sense with um, this discussion of even what John was describing, those four levels of, of racism. So I, I don't think we can talk about uh, mental health disparities or 
um, the impact of racism on mental health without talking about things like Tuskegee, um, in which we had black men, poor black men in, in particular, uh, basically infected with syphilis. Um, and when the researchers found that there was an effective treatment, they were never provided access to such treatment. So I think those types of instances, and there are many more uh, in our history, what we think about um, reproductive health um, has often been informed by um, the abuse of, of Black women and their bodies. So I think that those medical practices certainly lead to a legacy of distrust within communities of color as far as how they would be valued and um, treated, you know, even in a mental health situation. Uh, I was reading um, some time ago, maybe a week ago, Kerry Barnes um, on Twitter is a writer, I believe, in Toronto or somewhere in Canada. And she was talking about CBT, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is certainly a very effective approach for a variety of conditions, depression, anxiety. Uh, but I liked how they really highlighted that even using a CBT approach, if it does not appreciate the systemic factors that lead to people feeling anxious or symptoms of PTSD, um, systemic factors that lead to marginalization, discrimination, um, essentially encouraging people to change how they think and then they would feel better is further dehumanizing, further uh, victimizing and traumatizing for individuals. So those are just two examples I think that uh, certainly one is distrust of the medical or psychological field um, for obvious reasons, but the other one is that I think that the treatment approaches that we have um, identified in, in the literature often uh, do not take into account systemic factors that are certainly um, um, salient to communities of color. In that we have misdiagnosis, we have, um, uh, you know, clinicians who are trained to not think about the intersections of individuals, their clients' identities that lead to inaccurate decisions and sometimes wrong decisions. And if the intent of a proper diagnosis is to ultimately lead to um, effective treatment, we often get um, wrong diagnosis, again, leading to less accurate treatment outcomes for, for communities of color. So I think all of those factors play into where we are now, uh, coupled with what John was saying earlier. I think you also mentioned it, Christina, about the stigma associated with um, mental illness and just how communities may not value going to a therapist or going to seek treatment. But I think if we think about it from a systems level, you know, talking about socially just practices, it's always um, an interrogation, it's always a questioning of systemic factors that lead to the outcomes that we see. I can understand why there is mistrust, why there is um, a level of skepticism with engaging in mental health treatment. And um, again, for those reasons that I, I just identified. Right. And, and definitely, I mean, we, when I work with students and when I work with my psychologist here in Montgomery County and mm -hmm. they talk about um, some of the concerns that we see between, especially impoverished communities where yeah. um, they, like their, their lack of wanting to receive some of the support, I guess, because of the stigma, they're concerned of, you know, well, my child isn't crazy. Mm -hmm. and like, mm, yeah. like, wait, no, like um, getting mental health support doesn't mean that you're crazy, but that stigma has been there for so long. I mean, especially because if you're having um, trouble, then all of a sudden, I mean, long time ago, what did they do? They institutionalized you and all of a sudden right. they put you in the back of a white van and they carried you away for your family almost never to see you again. Mm -hmm. I can certainly um, speak to that as well. You know, in Loudoun, where I serve, I serve a, a schools that have primarily Spanish-speaking students from Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador. Love my students and families, but I quickly learned in probably my first or second year that the term psychologist carries very different connotations in their culture. Um, so again, n not thinking of me as someone to support you know, wholeness or academic achievement or social skills, but their first uh, response was often, my child's not crazy. 
Um, in their culture, that's what the psychologist was there for, to take care of the crazy people. So I, I definitely think we have work to do as clinicians, as evaluators, um, in understanding you know, people's cultural uh, reference to be more responsive um, to how they're feeling. You know, certainly with misdiagnosis, there's, you know, our instruments have typically been developed from a Eurocentric perspective. Um, most psychologists are white men and I think that for every instrument, it's going to inherently um, carry the worldview perspective and, and biases of those who develop those instruments. And they could be valuable for certain groups, um, valid for certain communities, but not for everyone. So I think it's always an opportunity for us as clinicians, uh, researchers, uh, practitioners to really understand the history, the, the kind of the development of these tests and how they can be used um, to benefit some, but also to harm others in our clinical practice. Right. I, I mean, love, um, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, yeah, you know, to speaking to what Dr. Barrett was talking about, you know, as we were discussing, this is for good reason, right? We have like generations of communities who have um, been asked to trust in a system and then had been taking uh, advantage of in such, I mean, inhumane ways. And this mm -hmm. goes on not just as far back as Tuskegee, as Dr. Barrett talked about, you know, we're talking about like the very process of colonization that took place. And recognizing now that we are in a place in time where we are just now feeling empowered as communities of color to go undergo a process of decolonization. What does that mean? It means questioning everything, mm -hmm. right? From the instruments that have been developed, from the uh, modalities that have been developed and, and understanding that they bring value, they can certainly bring value and they have profound limitations. And so how is it then that we inject this um, and really balance things out to inject a worldview. And that requires uh, clinicians of color, black, indigenous, and, and otherwise brown communities to uh, undergo their own process of decolonization, right? Like, mm -hmm. which is painful and lifelong work, you know, that um, that is required if we're going to be modifying these, these systems. Right. And mm -hmm. can I tell you all that? So sometimes I go and I help one of my colleagues in MCPS with her um, her, her um, testing class for those who are um, getting their certification special ed. So I go in and talk about cognitive testing. And they're so surprised when I bring up that the WISC was made from the Boy Scouts of America manual. <laughs> and they're like, wait, what? <laughs> and I'm like, so who, who attends um, the Boy Scouts? You know, and especially when it was created, it was white males. And so many of those questions, you know, continue on. And some of them are still as part of um, the most popular um, IQ test that is mm -hmm. out there. And so, I mean, when you talk about some bias, or mm -hmm. even with when you think about, um, and especially when you think about like the LGBTQ plus community. And so it wasn't that long ago when the DSM took out homosexuality as being a mental health disorder. What was it like the DSM three? And so yeah. I mean, it's kind of like, wait a minute. So you're telling me <laughs> that, um, so for when we think about these institutions of mm -hmm. racism and discrimination that has been there and how long, it's not that long ago that these things came about. And so this is why so many individuals um, who are impacted by racism and discrimination have this distrust in the mental health field. Mm -hmm. And so, and then when we get into next, you know, so what are the things that, in which it's all about the part two, like what are the things we need to do to break down these barriers to help people understand like why it's still important to go out and receive this support. So as we're going through there, so then next, so Mr. Olivaria, so I have a question for you. So can you share with us your thoughts on some of the systemic mental health concerns that have occurred um, to the LGBTQ plus community? Absolutely. And, you know, to one of the things I think that we really need as we're talking about this and having this conversation is staying focused, right? Like one of the things that happens is that people will talk about, um, for example, Black and LGBTQ, as if they're, uh, you know, totally separate uh, communities. So I'm talking specifically about LGBTQ communities of color here, right? And, and that's what we're talking about. And I think that's a big important piece of it is making sure that we are uh, recognizing the diversity within communities, right? And among communities. 
And you were right out, as you mentioned, right? 1973 was the first time that homosexuality was taken out of the DSM. This is the primary tool by which we measure the mental health of people, of human beings, right? Um, currently and, and very recently, did we begin to challenge the conversation we're having around uh, transgender people, right? You know, we currently have a diagnosis of gender dysphoria that is oftentimes misunderstood and, and quite frankly, is imperfect. You know, it's an improvement over what was there before, before it was, uh, the diagnosis was that this is an illness, right? Now we're talking about the distress associated with that experience, right? And, and so there's um, a lot of built in oppression, built in marginalization in our mental health and in our medical community. Uh, and when we talked about Tuskegee, you know, similar historical context is really needed in talking about LGBTQ communities in general. Um, currently in 2020, out of 56 jurisdictions in the country, the 50 states, DC and the five ter territories, only 22 ban uh, conversion therapy for minors, right? So we're talking about uh, 34 of our states and territories in this country that deem it acceptable, contrary to every advice given by every reputable mental health and medical community and, and association, that it is uh, permissible to engage in conversion therapy, which we know to be um, akin to torture. It is. Uh, it has really dire consequences for the health and well-being. LGBTQ um, uh, youth are already uh, five times more likely to have commit, uh, attempted suicide in comparison to their heterosexual peers. That is already a reality and in large part related to the marginalization and rejection that they experience from their loved ones and communities. So if we're talking about sort of distrust in the system um, and the inherent laws that we know are existing in this system, we look, we need not look any further, right, than um, the tools that we utilize, the ways in which we choose to categorize people, and the outcomes that we, uh, that we observe. Right. And thank you for sharing that. And because we know that the suicide rates of those in the LGBT community is high. And that is something um, that I know within our schools, I mean, we spend a lot of time focusing on talking about, you know, yeah. the um, adverse um, effect of the stigma and discrimination that takes place as to why these individuals yeah. um, uh, want to kill themselves. But let me bring up another piece, because this is something that um, I first learned about this a few years ago, and I know they recently talked about this on the NBC Nightly News um, last week. Um, but uh, another study that came out showing that young African American males have some of the highest rates of death by suicide out of any other racial groups. And this, these are individuals who are younger than 11 years of age. And so, because when we think about this, I mean, this goes back to um, the misdiagnosis, because what happens? So when we think of behavior, and behavior is on a continuum, right? You have um, behaviors, the yelling, kicking, throwing things, whatever, to the withdrawn depression, anxiety. We, in psychology terms, we call them like internalizing versus externalizing, or the externalizing being the yelling, kicking, screaming, and the internalizing being um, the anxious depression and so forth. But unfortunately, because of bias, many times teachers and those who work in education things that, oh, for those who may be depressed or anxious, those are the individuals who potentially may be suicidal. And not understanding that those on the other side of continuum are equally at risk of it. And that especially for boys, that they get misdiagnosed. So all I can, as a school psychologist, I can't tell you how many teachers would come to me and be like, my student has ADHD. Did you go to grad school? Did you learn how to do this? But and they had this bias of what ADHD is. And so and all of a sudden, what was it like? Um, and in the community I worked in in Waukegan, um, the students were predominantly Hispanic and African American. And so they would see, especially because all of a sudden they had disproportionality too, because the majority of students being referred for special education were still black males. And mm -hmm. 
they um, swore to God they had conduct disorder or oppositional defiant disorder or ADHD, when in truth is many of these kids were depressed and anxious. They had experienced trauma, all these other stuff. And so this is how, this is why us in education, we are missing students um, who are potentially suicidal. And so, so then it looks at, so what can we do in education in order to help? So I, I throw that out to both of you gentlemen. So what are some of the things that you all are seeing or, um, in terms of looking at this? Stuff? So like, what are some of the things that you have in terms of um, like how you're seeing it in your schools or in your practice? Or what are some things that we can help educators, um, especially when it comes to bias? Uh, would you like to go for it or would you like me to? Go ahead, Daniel. Yeah, well, I, what I was gonna say is, you know, in my practice, I'm dealing with uh, children in adult bodies, you know, as we all are, right? You know, we're, um, and, and oftentimes we're sort of, the things that we never got a chance to work on and resolve, and we, we go out into the world and become perhaps quite successful and we never get the chance to actually um, to grapple with. But, um, the, you know, when we think about the numbers, uh, Black Americans are three, uh, youth are three times more likely to be diagnosed with schizophrenia than their white peers, right? We're talking about like, the, and, and we have no no um, medical explanation for that. There's no, it's it, we, we attribute it and we account it to it to bias, right? And so we see the way that that can set people up onto a certain track, whether that is a school to prison pipeline, whether it's being institutionalized, whether it's even like in, um, being placed on medications that are, are quite frankly inappropriate and never tend to the underpinning of what's actually happening here, which is intergenerational transmission of trauma that is continuously perpetuated through the lived experience of black and brown people. You know, And when we layer on layers of identity, it becomes all the more damaging. When we think about someone being uh, a young black male who then I feel he's gay, right, and identifies as gay. When we think about the outcomes for black trans people, um, you know, it's absolutely devastating, right? So I, I think a little bit about how do we um, acknowledge and create spaces that are affirming to the myriad of layers of identity that we don't, um, that we don't dilute the conversations that we're having, right? Um, sometimes, you know, when we talk about even uh, Latino communities, that what we're really talking about when we talk about this is we're talking about black and brown Latino communities, right? There's a diversity in Latino communities and, and there are Latinos who are Euro, who, who are um, of, of Euro descent, primarily of European descent, right? And so like when we're thinking about all these things, not diluting the conversation, having a really direct, uncomfortable conversation as we are here today about uh, what we're specifically talking about here are the disparities and the outcomes that we experience for black and brown communities of these certain backgrounds and being able to address that, um, address that head on. And think and recognizing that what we are seeing is really the byproduct of generations of traumatic exposure that continue to be reinforced on a regular basis and it should be treated as such. It, not sort of losing sight of, of that trauma and um, giving permission to get distracted by things like ADHD. Not, not to say that these things aren't real, right? We're talking about ADHD, of course that's real. Of course schizophrenia is real. Why are we seeing these numbers and what is it distracting us from that is quite frankly right in front of us? I would echo um, what Daniel said, but I also want to go back to what Dr. Connolly also also mentioned as far as these this misunderstanding, misdiagnosing of, of boys or black boys in particular. Um, I think that it starts with certainly education of educators. You know, if if the primary um, referral path is coming from a teacher, um, how do they understand that some of the aggression, the hyperactivity, the agitation that looks like a child who is you know hyperactive and has ADHD could also be signs of underlying depression in a um, mood dysregulation mood disorder so I think that's certainly important but I want to echo what Daniel said about trauma that sometimes these students don't have neither they have neither ADHD nor depression it's just their trauma response to what's going on around them so I think it's certainly appropriate, it, it's more than kind of high time to to educate all staff, administrators, because I think with knowledge comes um, power and, and action to really be 
um, held accountable to, to doing better um, for our students and families. But I think it's it's certainly education. I, I think in this in this climate, you know, nationally, what's going on, I do think there's more openness to having these types of dialogue, this type of discussion. Um, what I'm fearful of or leery of is that it stops in a few weeks or a few months. Uh, we've kind of had our fill of equity and anti-racism and we move on kind of going back to the status quo. But, but I think that if we really want to, to use a kind of a cliche, uh, cliche term, reimagine what schools look like, we have to engage in these dialogues ongoing. I was speaking to a group of parents earlier today, and when parents talk about race and racism with their children, that's not a one-off conversation. That is an ongoing dialogue that's using real life events, current events to really frame things, make them real and meaningful for our students. So I would say all of that, um, certainly um, teachers are wonderful people, but you know, teachers are not psychologists and they don't have the training and background, but I do think we can help them along by giving them some perspective of what they're seeing may not always be what they think it is. I want to add to, to on top of what Dr. Bird said and, and building off of that, that even holding our field accountable, right, and clinicians is that, you know, we are, uh, I think, as a, as a field and as, a, as professions, that um, the, the bias plays out in us being a lot more protective of the diagnoses and the labels that are placed on white students mm -hmm. than we are of the labels and diagnoses placed on black and brown students. And you find it is you know, throughout my agency-based work, it was not uncommon to collect all the documents and to see just a laundry list of diagnoses that were placed on black and brown children uh, at very young ages, many of those diagnoses either competing with one another and incompatible with one another or um, inappropriate to the age group, right? And so thinking a little bit about how we um, are, are really applying a critical lens and really cross-checking you know, our, our field to be just as protective over the lives and the futures of black and brown children as we are their white peers. So I want to thank um, Dr. Barrett and Mr. Olivaria um, for this conversation. And so, um, but we do want to, we have more to this conversation to come. So in a couple of minutes, we're going to introduce our next set of panelists. Dr. Barrett and Mr. Olivaria will be back um, for our question and answer period later in this forum. So right now we're going to um, transition um, to um, some videos that we have from individuals from our community. My name is Troy Body, and I'm the Director of Equity for the Montgomery County Public School System. And I wanted to share with you a piece of art I created. It's one of the ways in which I express myself. And this piece is titled The Weight of the World Around Me. And the last couple weeks and months have been really heavy. And I thought back to my youth when I was in college as a freshman in Morehouse. And a lot of the things that are going on in the world today were things that were going on then. And so my 53-year-old self reflected back to my 18-year-old self. And so I created this piece just to empathize and reflect with our youth of today, with all these things going on in the world, and trying to make sense of them. But there is a glimmer of hope. And I'm hopeful that as I look at the crowds out marching, that we are moving toward being that more perfect union where we can all say enough of systematic racism and oppression. Hi everyone, my name is Wendy Mejia. I am a bilingual psychologist for the Silver Spring area. I currently work at Roscoe Nix Elementary School and Joanne Lelick at Broad Acres Elementary School. I identify as an Afro-Latina. I am Dominican and I was born and raised in the Bronx in New York. At a young age in school, I was taught three things. Do your work, speak when spoken to, and follow the rules. At the moment or at the time, I didn't realize the difference between the rules that the colored students had to follow as opposed to when my white peers were given these same rules. 
I understand now that this was a systemic approach to keeping colored people in line. Fast forward to today, I think those rules still apply. Every day that I go to work, I understand that I have to negotiate who I am in order to appeal to those of privilege and those in authority. For instance, on multiple occasions, I'm required to assist other, other schools with cases. Um, and so on a few occasions, I was, I was approached by my white colleagues and asked if I was the interpreter. Now there is nothing wrong with being an interpreter. However, what bothers me is that you take a look at me and you automatically assume that I could not be anything else or be more than what you see in front of you. I think Michelle Obama said it first when she speaks about this imposter syndrome, where even as a professional, you have doubts about your abilities. I too second guess and doubt myself. Am I speaking clearly? Am I doing this correctly? I always wonder if there's more that I could have done. I know that I am capable. However, I know that it's ingrained in my mind that I need to push harder, that I can only be but so good. And I, it almost feels like my success is limited to a degree. This is what I consider to be institutionalized oppression. My name is Diego Uriburu, Executive Director of Identity. And I want to talk about the impact on racism on our children. I have witnessed over and over again the tremendous negative impact that racism has on the psyche of our children. Uh, it, is, it is so powerful that it almost gets into the core of who our children believe to be. One time, trying to understand how deep uh, racism affects them, and we asked middle school young people to write on a blank sheet of paper how they believed others viewed them. A hundred percent of them had negative comments. Things like, they see us as brown and ugly, uh, the only useful to clean bathrooms, gang members, etc. And some of the ways in which racism materializes in, in their behavior is that for many of them, they see uh, these perceptions, they see it as real, and they begin to reject the culture of origin. They reject the language of their parents, they reject the culture of their parents, the parents try to speak to them in, in, in Spanish, and they refuse to because they do not be, they do not want to be associated with, with being poor, with cleaning bathrooms, with being thieves and gang members, etc. It also happens when, <clears throat> when more acculturated or US born Latinos beat, no, physically beat a newly arrived Latinos as a way to differentiate themselves from although they look alike, to differentiate that we are not like those who don't speak English, etc. So we have to combat it head on. We have to address it in schools. And I applaud MCPS for these efforts. Thank you very much. We're going to move into the next panel in a moment. But before we do, I'd like to introduce our deputy superintendent and one of my favorite people, Dr. Monifa McKnight. Thank you so much, John, Dr. Connolly, for having me here this evening. What an important conversation that we're having tonight. It's so interesting. Uh, we had a technical difficulty earlier, and I wasn't able to, uh, to be viewed or be heard. And at the beginning of the program, when Dr. Connolly said, we're waiting for Dr. McKnight to arrive, I was screaming, saying, I'm here, I'm here, because this is the best place to be this evening, having the most meaningful conversation that has significant impact and in no way, shape or form would I want to miss that opportunity. So I say all of that to say, thank you so very much for having me here this evening. Um, I come here as, de for, as deputy superintendent for Montgomery County Public Schools. And this is actually my first year transitioning back into 
MCPS and, and within this position. And it has indeed been quite a year to say the least. Uh, I think about a year ago, excited to come in, never would have imagined that we would be managing a, a health pandemic that resulted in us closing our schools. And you know the story after that. But I tell you, it's been a lesson because as we've had to navigate the circumstance, I, I, I just see that we've had staff and, and, and families and community members working countless hours to figure out how to provide the services that we provide for our students and families amidst the health pandemic. And as we were working through this, of course, there were things that personally resonated with me um, as a black woman and a leader that made it very personal for me. So it definitely got my attention and became areas of concern when I saw that African-Americans were being impacted by COVID-19 in a different way, which then took me back to all of the things that impact a community being at risk and how it takes decades and years and years and years of, uh, of, of history and, and inequities that contribute to that and saying, here we are in the middle of this and we're still having this problem. We're thinking about how it's significantly impacting African-Americans. And it's personal to me because not only am I African-American, my family, I thought about my mother um, who would be a vulnerable age and then race. And, and, and think about the impact of it. So it is very personal to me. And then I, I saw those images in the news and, and heard the reports. And then of course, then we have the videos and stories about the deaths of African-Americans um, that have been killed. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, um, Ahmaud Arbery, Rashad Brooks. And I'm saying, so we have a health pandemic and on top of that, it's also a risk to be African-American based on all of those incidents. And that was very personal to me also because I have a son who's eight years old. And while I've had a difficult time, you know, managing the pandemic and having to be at home and adhering to the stay at home order, I shared with some team members, it was probably the one time in my life that I was actually thankful that I could be at home, but most importantly, that my son, who is an African American boy, was within the safety of his home. Because I didn't have the worry about him going out and having any experiences, whether it may be in school or an after school program or with anyone that may look at him and not immediately see that he is a caring, loving, innocent child, but would see first that he is African American. And for whatever that could mean for them, could mean something that could inadvertently have him have a negative experience with someone. I did not have to worry about that because he was in the care and safety of my home where I could guarantee love and to be vulnerable and to be safe. And as I thought about that, I then reflected on why it is so important for me to take my leadership in a school system, very important, and how this has to be a part of the work that I do every single day. Because in that context, I was thinking about Aiden McKnight, but everyone sends me their own Aiden McKnight um, into the school system as a child. And it reminded me of my responsibility to make sure that I'm a part of shifting the work so that my worry at that moment doesn't become the worry of any other parent in the school system. And so for that, I'm grateful and I'm honored to be serving in the capacity in which I serve. And so as I think about this, it is a vital conversation that we are having in MCPS and we will continue to have. Um, I said, I actually ended up not being able to connect until we figured out the technical difficulties because clearly it was meant for me to hear the conversation that was, that was had earlier with the panelists. When Dr. Barrett said, this cannot be an event, I wanted to stand up and start clapping because that's exactly where we go wrong. We can't wait until another incident that happens like what happened with George Floyd to say, we have to be active and we can't get tired. And this is the work that has to be done all the time in every way possible. And so as a school system leader, I know it's an important conversation, but it has to go beyond conversation. It has to be a conversation in every space, in every office, in every aspect of the work all the time. 
and nor can it be optional. So I'm excited about the work that we have that we have ahead of us in the system and with many people in helping to lead this charge. Uh, we know that poor students uh, or, or, or that poor student mental health correlates with negative outcomes, um, including poor academic achievement and behavioral problems and truancy, all the things that we talked about earlier. And so it's up to us to make sure we shift that narrative and make sure that that's not the experience that students have moving forward as we shape the environment that we want them to grow in and learn in. So here in the district, we're gonna to continue to move that charge forward. I'm excited to be one of many leaders to do that. It is within the vision of what we want to accomplish in MCPS to have those honest conversations and to deal with the long history and practices that targeted people of color and people in LGBTQ communities um, that have experienced this over time. So I'm excited to be a part of this conversation and to work with you and to make MCPS an equitable anti-racist school district, no matter what. So thank you again for having me this evening and I look forward to continuing the work with you. Thank you, Dr. McKnight. Thank you for um, modeling what an honest conversation look like, looks like from a leader and also for giving us the charge to make this more than a conversation and for the idea of getting we're, we're trying to do is get to an anti-racist organization. So thank you for that. We're gonna continue with our conversation with the next set of panelists. In the last um, panel discussion, they talked a lot about the historic practices and policies that got in the way of people of color having access to receiving quality mental health services. Now they began talking about what some of the current challenges are as well. And we're gonna continue that part of the conversation. So I am very excited to introduce our next three panelists. The first is Dr. Da Dr. Karen Cruz, who's the supervisor for school counseling for Montgomery County Public Schools. She's worked in MCPS for 20 years. She's a counselor leader whose professional experiences include teaching, counseling, and school administration. She has designed and implemented numerous professional development programs focused on mental health and student achievement. Welcome, Dr. Cruz. Next up, uh, I'm also so pleased to welcome Corporal Sharice Junius, who has been a Montgomery County police officer for 14 years and is currently assigned to Montgomery Blair High School as the school resource officer, sometimes known as SROs. In addition to this position, Corporal Junius is also a crisis intervention team officer and regularly responds to assistive citizens who suffer from mood and thought disorders. Welcome, Dr. Corporal Junius. And next up, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. David Schreiber, who is a school psychologist and professor of education at Indiana University. His research and advocacy work focuses on social justice topics and education. So welcome all three of you. Y'all on the screen, there we go. Hello. Hello. So um, we're gonna begin the conversation and I'm going to begin by asking Dr. Schreiber a question. And something Dr. McKnight said uh, made me think about a question for you. She, talk to us about wanting to make this an anti-racist organization. So I'm wondering if you could think, talk to us a little bit about what are some of the current practices and policies that are barriers for having equitable access to mental health services for students of color and families of color? And what are some of those barriers to making us an anti-racist organization? Sure, thank, thank you so much for uh, inviting me, John and uh, Dr. Connolly. I'm honored to be part of this, this group. I, I really appreciated how uh, both uh, you, John, and some of others shared a little bit of their personal experiences. So I'd like to share just a little bit of mine as a way of answering this question. So schools are a microcosm of society. That's one of the things I love about schools. All the issues, positive or negative, that happen in our, in our society get reflected in schools, including our country and society's history around race. 
Um, so when I started out as a school psychologist, um, I think hopefully like, like anyone who would enter educational field, I had good intentions. Um, I certainly did not, I'm, I'm a white male. I did not uh, claim that I understood all of racism and I was not consciously racist, but that doesn't mean that, that I wasn't doing things, um, uh, that I didn't hold biases that got in the way of my uh, desire to have effective mental health practices. Uh, Dr. Barrett and, and uh, Daniel spoke about the historical legacy. And I think that, that was a big part that I was missing. So like I would work with kids and in my mind, I not knowing this history very well and not having appreciation, I would start from the assumption of kind of that I was on starting from kind of a blank slate with whom whichever child or family I was meeting. But in reality, that's not what's happening, right? So I'm a school psychologist. So when I, what I didn't appreciate at first is when I meet with children, families, I represent to them school, right? And whatever their history, past history has been with school. Psychologists, which pulls up people's associations with counseling and mental health. And I'm also white, I'm male, right? And so all these things, I'm not starting from a, a blank slate with anyone. I'm inheriting whatever their experiences have been related to that. Um, sometimes those are positive experiences, but often uh, particularly from pers for persons of color um, as how they had lots of reasons not to be trustful of me. So I didn't necessarily see that at first. And then you start to, do, to implement mental health supports and then you, you misinterpret things, right? So people are responding, children, families in a way that makes total sense given that history that I'm not aware of. And then through my own white fragility, right? So I, I'm, people aren't responding the way I hope. I can't think, well, it can't possibly be me. It must be them, right? And so you get, you get sort of defensive. I don't wanna be thought of as a racist, racist person. And so that can make it even more, more challenging, right? So I think what, what happens sometimes with this, if we're not consciously aware of it, including the, the mental health providers being aware of our own biases, none of us are, have, are without racism. We're not always consciously aware of it, so it may be implicit, but there are things I was doing that were, that were not in line with anti-racism work at that time. I just didn't realize it. So, what, so whatever system you're, you're designing, you could have sort of the most up-to-date evidence-based practices, but if you're not attuned, and that's important, but if you're not attuned to some of those dynamics at the individual level, at the classroom level, at the school level, you're, you're not going to connect as well as you could. And I think not, again, that I'm perfect in this way, but as I came to understand this more, and particularly some of my own uh, behaviors, I got a lot more effective in my mental health work because I was able to see a different perspective. I was able to communicate to kids, hopefully, that I, I valued them as, as, as cultural beings um, and that I was aware of some of those uh, uh, dynamics. So um, I, you also, I, I know one, one of the, you mentioned I, my background is in social justice as well. So I'll just quickly say, um, to me, social justice can be a powerful framework for, for addressing. Uh, th this type of thing. Um, it wasn't an accident talking about history that the NAACP chose education as the centerpiece for Brown versus Board of Education. It's because the NAACP and segregationists both understood the power of education and impacting the lives of all children. So for me, social justice is a reminder of that and it's sort of like a gives moral calling to my work, but also really important, a social justice framework gave me the capacity to go from the individual desire to be anti-racist to a way of thinking about problems and a way of addressing structural inequalities that can then translate my work, not just individually, but across a, a system. And so, uh, so I'll, I'll stop there, um, but. Thank you, thank you so much uh, for sharing that with us and for also talking from your own personal experience and modeling that as well. Um, I'm gonna, turn to Dr. Cruz. And before I ask the question, I just also want to, want to remind everyone listening that you can ask questions, put in your question in the Q&A box, and uh, we'll come back and address some of those questions in the next part of the session. So Dr. Cruz, um, Dr. Schreiberg and our previous panelists talked a lot about the po policies and practices in the field itself that can be challenges for providing mental health services or receiving mental health services. And um, in MCPS, we have some families that know how to use the system really well, that are taking 
lots of advantage of all the different kinds of things that we can offer. And we have other families and other students who are not getting any of those services or don't know how to take those, um, those services. So can you talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing right here in Montgomery County Public Schools? Yes, absolutely. First of all, thank you for having me on the panel. Um, I, I do want to say that I love um, what Dr. Schreiber said about making sure that um, we are thinking about our own biases and that there's an understanding of what those are. Um, I see in MCPS, um, we really have to make sure that our teachers, our counselors, um, school psychologists and our staff really understand the effects of inequitable practices in our schools and that we are working to remove those barriers for our, our students, particularly our students that are in low income, income families. So I think you basically said it too often, um, our parents and caregivers that are of wealth, not only know about the services for their child, um, that are in the schools, but they also fight to have those um, services received by their child. And so many of our low income black and brown parents and caregivers, however, may not know about these services and the advantages the services can provide to their child, or they have a stigma, as we've said repeatedly um, throughout this show. They, they believe the stigma that's associated with mental health or mental health diagnosis for their child um, might have a negative impact on their child. So it's really important, um, I think, when we when we talk about mental health and we talk about what we're seeing in MCPS, I don't think we can have that conversation without having an understanding of the need for our staff and our teachers to understand um, student learning concerns. Um, making sure that they are, when they're in a classroom and they're seeing those learning concerns, that they're following processes that we have, especially around, um, you know, if they suspect that a student has a learning disability, what do they need to do? And it can't be an assumption, right? Like, like Dr. Connolly said earlier, you know, um, if the student is showing some aggressive behavior, oh, well, I assume that that student needs special education. Not, no, we, we, we need to really start thinking about, um, you know, what does that mean and digging deeper. And so I think um, our teachers and our, our counselors, especially, they understand the learning process. However, I think that we need to make sure that they're bringing um, concerns to the table. You know, we have programs like, or we have processes like our educational management team meetings. We have our um, process, you know, meetings that, data meetings. So when those teachers are seeing concerns in the classroom, it's important that those discussions with the school psychologist and the counselor and others are taking place in, the, in those meetings to have a rich discussion around what's really going on with the student? What's the root cause of what's happening here? Is this something that you know, we're seeing uh, the student has had some concerns in their community um, and so they're kind of acting out because something happened last night or is this really something that is happening consistently in the classroom with this particular student? So, so I think getting our staff to understand um, that they need to use the processes that we have in place, that they are using those processes and that we are really thinking about what are what's happening in the classroom with students and what are the mental health needs of our students. And then, you know, more importantly, providing students with the support that they need, um, all students. And I think when we talk about our families of wealth, as we said before, they, they know those supports. Now it's our job to make sure that all of our parents and students are aware of those supports and those services, and that we are ensuring that students are getting what they need. Um, the other piece though that I wanna share about that is that we, we also have to kind of be careful um, to make sure that we are appropriately recognizing those learning concerns in students. Um, this is again where you know, it's important to make sure teachers have a deep understanding of inequities and specifically the overrepresentation of black and brown students that are diagnosed with learning disabilities. So we don't, we, we really have to 
um, make sure again that we're using the processes that we have in place to help to prevent overrepresentation, but more appropriate, um, you know, diagnosis of students. Um, I often share that sometimes, you know, as I, I work with school counselors. And I've been a school counselor and I can remember teachers, you know, saying things to me like, you know, this student is just checking out in class. He's not paying attention. And I think something's wrong. I think the student, you know, might have a learning disability. And I'm, I'm kind of like Dr. Connolly said, looking like because the student checked out, you think they have a learning disability? No, we, we really need to um, make sure that, that our staff are are culturally competent as well, that they're understanding the differences in cultures and that a student may behave one way at home and some of those behaviors are normal in their home and in their culture that may be different than your culture. And so it's, it's those types of things that I think um, we really have to ensure that we are um, educating our staff about, that we're educating our parents and families um, around those mental health concerns that we see and that they are equipped with that information so that they can better meet the needs of, the stu of their students as well. Thank you, thank you very much. So much of what you talked about has come up in a lot of the dialogues that we've done with students and families. They talk about having those kinds of experiences. So thank you for sharing that with us. And we're gonna move to Corporal Junius um, and you're um, in a different position than many of the others on this panelist. You're a, a SRO, a police officer, and uh, expert in uh, crisis intervention. Could you talk a little bit about what you see as some of the challenges from your vantage point and some of what you see as working? Uh, yes. First, I just, want to, I just want to thank you all for inviting me on. I think this is a very um, important conversation that needs to be had. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about um, how we handle people with mental uh, health crisis as an SRO and how patrol officers handle them. So there's uh, several differences between how an SRO might handle a student who may be suffering from a mental health crisis and how a patrol officer may handle a citizen who is in mental health crisis. First, patrol officers are limited in what they can do with citizens depending on the circumstances that cause the officers to get involved. The officer can either transport the citizen to the hospital or they can take them to the central processing unit of the county jail. Uh, an SRO in the school setting, like myself, um, a lot of times I work with, uh, other, with administrators, uh, other staff members, counselors, um, and sometimes the school psychologists to provide students with support. Uh, generally, the SRO is called to assist um, if students uh, pose a threat to themselves or other students. Um, sometimes SROs are called to assist at the request of the parents. Or in some cases, SROs can sit in on meetings where there's already a relationship that exists between a student and an SRO. Uh, speaking to my own experiences, I've developed I've been able to develop relationships with students who struggle with mental illness and have been able to assist with calming them down and maybe bringing them to a place where they can make rational decisions. Uh, when appropriate, getting them uh, to agree to see their therapist or agree for their parents or for myself to take them to the hospital for an emergency evaluation if it's needed. Um, some of the hurdles I've encountered as an SRO with minority students uh, who suffer from mental health issues often stem from parents who don't have adequate health insurance or financial means to seek further care for their child, or sometimes parents who for one reason or another don't agree with that their child is in need of uh, any mental health services. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, from all three of you, you can see that those levels of um, barriers, racial barriers that we talked about at the beginning of this session, you can see where some of this has to do with individual own beliefs, individuals own beliefs, whether it's internal or external. And we also see this idea of what are some of the practices that maybe aren't working um, and policies that aren't working that we need to address. And then the structural part, as you talked about Corporal Genius is healthcare, that's where it all sort of fits together, access to healthcare. We are out of time for our particular panel. Um, so I wanna thank you all. You're gonna be coming back. Everyone will see them again in our Q&A right after this next set of videos. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. Thank you. Hello, this is Edwin Hernandez, Parent Community Coordinator 
in the Equity Initiatives Unit of Montgomery County Public Schools. How we think, how we feel, and how we behave has a direct relationship to low achievement, chronic absences, disruptive behavior, and dropout rates in our schools. When we talk about mental health and barriers caused by racism, we must understand that students have trauma and those are barriers in developing sometimes those skills. For example, I think about a student that would come in into the school and maybe um, feel that they don't want to connect with their teachers or they just want to put their head down or a student that constantly is getting in trouble and being sent to the principal's office and the student is getting consequences for their behavior or student that just doesn't show up to school and instead gets a job or a student that drops out of school and doesn't want to finish and, and we try to identify how we help this, those students. We have meetings with the students, but sometimes it is something more in understanding that sometimes students feel invisible. They don't feel that none of it applies to them or connects with them. And sometimes it is because the way that we teach or just the way that our policies are made. These are students that don't feel that none of this connects to them, that is applicable to them. And how do we have the courage and the authenticity to change those policies, to go and do something different, something that is creative, that we feel that we can connect to our students in a different way, in understanding the trauma that keeps them from success, from finishing school, from coming and being engaged every day into our classrooms. My name is Sharon Juan and I'm a school psychologist. I believe it's essential for MCPS to talk about mental health and the barriers created by racism because simply it's a reality in our schools. As a school psychologist, I often observe firsthand how students of color, especially African-American students and Hispanic students, are often referred to the Office for Discipline Issues and to the Special Education Team for Learning Issues, but we haven't always considered their life circumstances. For example, these students might be responsible for caring for multiple siblings at home. They may not have electricity at home, or they may have witnessed a parent being just deported to a different country. In addition, um, students of color, especially Asian students, are less likely to access mental health services due to perceived social stigma. And for Asian st students, this is due to racial stereotyping, such as a model minority stereotype. And a lot of students have suffered from trauma and stress, so it's important that they get refer to special. Um, mental health services instead. So it's our job as educators to work both individually and as a system to, to have these discussions so that we can address these racial barriers. Hi everyone, my name is Dalvin Osario and I am the program manager for the Children with Intensive Needs program at the Montgomery County Collaboration Council. One of the reasons why it's so important for MCPS to have these difficult conversations around institutional racism is because if we don't name it, we can't do the things necessary in order to be able to solve that problem. As I chair our local care team, I constantly get parents that come forward and talk about how difficult it is to navigate the system that is MCPS, whether that's talking about getting services for their children who have IEPs or just simply feeling heard. And those things, those difficulties, those barriers that are put in their place are absolutely a byproduct of institutional racism. We're a school system of 166,000 students. Diversity is at the forefront of all of those students. And with their shared experience and their lived experience, it becomes much harder to ensure that they receive the services that they need if we do not tackle this problem head on. We're now gonna move into our question and answer period. And um, Gillian Hubner and Shel Cherry have been going through the questions and they are going to begin asking us the questions. Good evening, everyone. My name is Shella Cherry. I'm the Director of Student Leadership and Extracurricular Activities. Also with me today is... Hi, I'm Gillian Hubner and I am the Chair of the Montgomery County Council of PTAs Subcommittee on School Climate and Safety. 
We want to thank all the community members that um, shared with us um, several questions um, that we will bring forth to the panelists today. And if we don't get to all of the questions, please be certain that we are going to hold on to all of these and bring them back to our July 7th program or part two of this courageous conversation. Gillian, you wanna get us started? Sure, yes, there were so many good questions coming in. And I know that one that's um, front and center on a lot of people's minds is, and I'm gonna um, direct this to Corporal Junius, if you can come back on. Can you speak a little bit about the training that police officers get, and maybe even especially SROs, to help them understand what mental health sy symptoms look like when they respond to a call? Okay, so basically starting with a, a brand new police officer um, that's right out of police academy, um, we have a section basically called dealing with people. We learn how to deal with all people, especially for um, police officers, new officers that uh, have no experience or directly uh, coming from college. Um, so they learn how to kind of deal on top of people. I think that's kind of a loss. Um, um, a lot of people aren't able to do that because we're in our cell phones a lot. So that's the first level of training that we have. Um, we spend a good amount of time in the academy doing that. Um, after they've graduated police academy and we are on patrol for a little while, we have opportunity to go to, to uh, the CIT training, which is a crisis intervention team. And that's actually a 40 hour um, training. Uh, we, they do it in um, with NAMI and they do it at, um, at the crisis center. We actually get to experience what it's like to uh, as best as, as they can replicate it for us to be a person suffer, suffering from schizophrenia. Um, so that entails basically putting on headphones and, and kind of hearing different voices say things. And then they give you these uh, uh, missions that you have to accomplish while you have these voices in your head. Um, and then we also basically uh, speak to people with mental illness. Uh, we go to a couple of group homes and we also go to uh, Springfield, which is a mental hospital. And we, and we kind of get a better understanding of what, what those people deal with and, and um, how they like to, or prefer to be talked to, how we can better assist them. Um, as an SRO, uh, we, uh, the majority of the SROs have been through the uh, basic SRO school, which is through the National Association of School Resource Officers. And we've also done some training uh, through the state of Maryland. Uh, we're basically uh, learning how to understand like the um, development of the team mind and then understanding how traumatic um, experiences uh, may affect the development of a, of a team's mind. Thank you so much. Um, I think this question might be better suited for Dr. Barrett or whoever else would like to join in. Um, the question says, um, do you believe that mental health issues in minority communities are worse due to societal injustice, or is it just the amount that is undiagnosed that makes it seem worse in this majority group? Well, that's a great question. I, I don't know that it's worse in minoritized groups. Um, I do think it's compounded by systemic injustice, um, but I would be I will be speaking out of turn with no, no real data to support that it's worse in minor, minoritized groups. I think, I think I'll, I'll echo something that I said before that I think a lot of what we see or we think is mental illness could just be a natural response to injustice. Um, and, and it's nothing that should be pathologized. So I'm always careful about um, framing you know, mental health difficulty as being, you know, internal to the individual um, rather than really a function of poor systemic um, racism or other structures that lead to negative outcomes. So it's a great question, um, but I, my gut will say no, that it's not worse, um, but I hear what you're saying that certainly it looks like there could be, um, you know, more significant concerns in minoritized communities. But I, would all, I always try to get back to the systemic factors that, that lead to difficulty in the first place and addressing those uh, should lead to more positive outcomes for all people. Thank you. So here's a question um, that really goes to the teachers who are navigating how to support students in the midst of this kind of cascade of crises. Um, 
maybe Karen Cruz would like to answer it. I, I'll leave it up to you guys, whoever wants to jump in. But how can teachers support mental health when it comes to racism? And how do we make sure that we're not further re-traumatizing re students when we have conversations about racism in our classrooms and school settings? I'll jump in on that. Um, so I think that is very important, first of all, that um, our teachers, we talk a lot about building relationships with students and families. And we talk a lot about the need for our teachers to also be trained on how to have those conversations and getting them understanding their own biases and understanding um, their differences and the differences of their students. And so I think one of the things that's, that's most important um, when we talk about having teachers talk to students about racism and um, having them talk to them about the racial injustices that have specifically recently occurred, it's very important that um, our teachers understand that first of all, they are coming to the table with, you know, if they are non people of color, um, they're coming to the table with a different experience. So they need to, to be open and honest about that. I think our students respond to that type of um, honesty and helps the students to also trust the teacher and understanding that they are doing the best they can to explain and to under and to to talk about the topic. And so I think you know it's important that we do our part in MCPS in talking with our teachers about how to have those conversations. And I know we are in the process of doing some trainings over the summer and and we've provided lots of resources from various um, locations, you know, the American Psychological Association, the American School Counseling Association to our mental health providers so that they can also work with their teachers on having those conversations. But I think the, the most important thing is that the teacher is being honest and the teacher is thinking about their own experiences and understanding and recognizing those differences. Um, I think that's a start. Thank you so much. Uh, there was a question um, that was posed to us as well. Um, it says within the LGBTQ plus community, how big is the difference between adult suicide rates and teen suicide rates versus their um, cis counterparts or even, um, you know, in the intersection of race as involved as well? Yeah, so, so admittedly, yeah. I think the data is more, um, is more, there's more data supporting the numbers around youth, right? Um, and I think the, the numbers that I've seen have been that it's uh, just over twice as likely to have attempted suicide in adulthood um, in comparison to five times more likely in youth. And some of that is about, you know, being out in the world and being able to choose your community and being able to, um, to, to receive that support. You know, I think that re regardless of, of what those rates are, something that we've been talking a little bit about is, you know, how do we support and whether it's parents supporting their children, whether it's us as a society supporting each other, allyship of different forms. I think it, one of the foundational steps is believing, believing people, right? When people explain to you their pain, when people are, have the brave bravery and the courage to articulate their pain, um, that we believe them and that we start from that place um, and, and build from there. And sometimes we're sort of conditioned to poke holes and to say, but did you, do you think they really meant it that way? Or, you know, are you sure you're not overreacting? Or, you know, and, and just the basic step of being able to say, I believe you, I'm sorry that happened to you, right? And how, what can we do from here? That is just so powerful and that elevates the conversation in a really productive way. So I'll, I'll send this one to Dr. Schreiberg. Um, this has to do with the relationship between parents and school systems. But so we understand that teachers need education to help navigate these issues. Um, but it's also really hard raising, being a parent in these times, right? Whether you're white and you may not have fluency in talking about race or whether you're a person of color and you're really concerned about how this is landing on your student. Are, we, are our kids feeling substandard or other? 
um, or less than? And how do we as parents navigate this? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's something that schools often uh, tend not to think, think about as, as much. I mean, so we're, we're educators and as a school psychologist, like I'm pretty used to thinking that talking about a child's mental health, like that's what I signed up to do, right? But typical parent, they may not be thinking that the school is like the logical place to be talking about their things beyond academics and their, and their children, right? And so sometimes as a school, I think we kind of make assumptions that parents are going to share things with us parent and families of all backgrounds. And we may not have done the work to establish the, the type of trust that, that Daniel was just uh, speaking about to, to uh, connect that. So in thinking about it from a parent perspective, um, I think, you know, forming relationships with people in, in the school that you trust and helping to kind of learn kind of, it shouldn't always be the role of the parents to kind of know everything the educators know, but I think kind of on both sides, there's a, there's a responsibility both for schools to try to communicate effectively with parents and avoid using jargon and really try to communicate level of trust and respect, but also from the parent side to come in with, with the attitude is, okay, there are things that I know about my child that better than the school will ever know. There may be things that the school sees in my child that I don't get to see at home. And so that there's a value in hearing from, from the school. So I think just kind of as, as a parent, trying to kind of see things from multiple perspectives, seeing that like what you're seeing at home may or may not correspond to what the school is seeing. And if the school is seeing it differently, it's not necessarily because they don't like your child or they disagree, they're just seeing something different and really having the communication skills to really navigate that. I think it's a, it's a dual uh, uh, re responsibility. Thank you so much. I'd like to throw this question back to Dr. Cruz and um, Mr. Lannisman and even Dr. Connolly, if you would like. Um, thinking about um, the times that we're in and the uncertainty of what school looks like, compounded with the idealism and the wonderful things that um, Dr. McKnight even spoke to, um, the need to provide social emotional learning as well as address um, social justice. Um, one question um, shared with us tonight says, although we talk about the need for social emotional learning and social justice discussions to be priority in all schools and with all staff, it still seems to fall on counselors to provide direct instruction, sometimes maybe with some reservation from the staff about social emotional lessons. Um, maybe it takes time away from academics and so forth. How do we move forward with a systemic change of thought for schools to own this process and understand that all educators must care for young people's mental health as well as their academic piece? I can start um, just a couple of things. So I will say that during COVID-19, um, we learned a lot. And so one of the things that we did um, this year with our social emotional learning lessons during COVID-19 um, was that we actually had teachers at the elementary level um, implementing those lessons. And from that, you know, the counselors co-taught, but the teachers, we received a lot of really great feedback about those lessons. And so we are in the process now of really taking what we learned from COVID-19 and building out a social emotional learning um, process for counselors, teachers um, moving into the fall. And so we're in the process of building that out. Um, also looking at ways to include that the SEL in the curriculum. And so we are in that process of really um, delving into that work and figuring out how we can make the schools have more ownership of social emotional learning in all aspects of content and in all aspects of school life. And so we, we are working on that. I don't know if Dr. Connolly, if you want to add to that as well. Right. And so I think that we as educators, um, we all have to be open to understanding the social emotional needs of 
all of our children and that we all have a place um, in that in terms of their education. You know, I, I bring up this example because I know like during COVID-19, I got elementary school teachers were all up and ready to go and they embraced the SDL lessons with a passion. And they were many of them, even my daughter's teacher was um, doing many of those lessons. Our secondary one struggled a little bit more and their training is a little bit different. And so they may not have like the, um, understanding or sometimes just the experience in being able to do that. So it will require additional training for our teachers to help them to feel comfortable um, with incorporating this. But I say this, so, and I bring up this example when I talk about SEL. If you are a teacher, let's say you're an English teacher who's teaching Romeo and Juliet, you know, and we all, many of us went through it in the state of Maryland in ninth grade. If you're teaching Romeo and Juliet, and this is part of the Shakespeare chapter and whatever part of the year it is, you know, one of the biggest things that happens in Romeo and Juliet is that the two students kill themselves at the end. So isn't that a wonderful time to talk about suicide prevention? Isn't Romeo and Juliet an awesome opportunity to talk about conflict management between the Montesquieu's and the Capulets? So there are ways of incorporating social emotional learning lessons into what we normally teach that doesn't take away or just has to always be something in, you know, like I add this something in addition to what we already do. There are ways that these conversations fit naturally into um, the many academic topics that we teach. And it's just a matter of helping people to feel comfortable and giving them the tools to be able to do it because this is new. This isn't something that um, we've been expected, but as we are learning and as we're growing as um, a modern education system that we have to know that both the social emotional needs of our kids are equally important to the academic needs. Because when you have a child who goes out, we're preparing them to be citizens and do great things in the world and get a job and so forth. So while yes, the park scores are very important, but when they go off and get a job, is it equally important that they understand how to work together with others, that they can do teamwork activities and communicate well and regulate their emotions and um, just doing things in order to be able to, you know, work as a group and work with others. Like that's important. When, when somebody comes to your house, let's say you have a child and they're bringing their significant other home for the first time in their lives. Is it important that they pass park or is it important that they're good human beings that are going to treat other people well? So when we sit there and we talk about like the academic stuff isn't important, um, well not the academic, the academic part is important, but the social emotional stuff isn't as important as academic because you come to school to learn. You come to school to learn about all of it because you're not going to be able to function in society without the social emotional pieces. And so we all have to be at a place where we are comfortable with knowing that both are equally important to our students' lives and that, and what can each of us do to help to educate students on many of these topics. So um, as Dr. Cruz said, as Ms. Um, Cherry said, which I also want to congratulate both of you on your promotions yesterday at the board meeting. So I just had to throw that out there, sorry. Um, but as we're going through this, um, we just, we have to keep these things in mind, so. All right, so I think it's time. We have come to the end of uh, part one of our Waymaking special. Um, we do wanna thank all of our panelists, um, those who have participated in um, providing videos um, for our event, um, for our two um, wonderful individuals who helped with the Q&A portion and to my extraordinary hosts um, for um, helping to put part one together. Um, we do want to remind individuals that there's, this is part one and part two is on July the 7th. Um, and it is also from 6.30 to 8 p.m. We know that we did not get, get a chance to get to all of our community questions. And some of that we were looking through them and said, hey, that's a great question for the 7th. Because as you can see on the 7th, we're going to be talking about strategies, practices, and policies that are needed to eliminate barriers for communities of color to access and receive quality mental health support. So many of your questions um, will be part of that conversation then. Um, we also want 
want to make sure we highlight our Waymaking Special website um, that has resources. Um, that are available um, in terms of mental health resources and additional information about equity and race. Um, so please feel free to go to our Waymaking Special website to um, get in this information that's there. And then also, um, we just want to make sure that people know that they can fill out an evaluation um, for our event. Um, you can use the QRL code or you can um, go to the link that's there. The link is also on our Waymaking Special website. So again, I want to thank John, Shella, Gillian, and our expert panel and those who submitted videos for your time to be with us today. And we want to thank our viewers for joining us for Waymaking. To send us additional questions and topics to discuss on the show, please visit the link on your screen. Also, please go to our YouTube playlist to find additional shows in our Waymaking series. This evening's program was also live streamed on YouTube and will be available for playback. Don't forget to subscribe to our MCPS TV YouTube channel and follow us on Twitter for more programming and updates from MCPS. And please join us next time for MCPS Waymaking.